Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by saying that it's always an honor and a privilege to stand before anyone and to share what you love, what you embrace. And me, it's art. And today I've been invited, uh, respectfully invited, to give a presentation on what is creative research. Okay, there's all types of research. But what is creative research? And it's interesting because most people uh, have a tendency to say, okay, I see the artwork, I see the artist statement, but I don't understand. What makes it research? It's a painting. Duh. Oh, it's a print. You run through a print, you put some ink on the, you put, that's it. You get some clay, you play with it, and you put it together. Yeah. What's the research about that? What is the, I mean, what makes it research? Well, before I actually get into the, what is research, creative research particularly, I want to explain something that I, uh, that I was able to pick up, and that is, in the art world, there are basically two types of artists. There's the horizontal artist, and there's the vertical artist. Uh, to be, oh, I gotta, I gotta give a shout out. This information that I'm sharing with you it was shared on, um, uh, what's that, TED Talk? Right? There was an a, a, a artist on, on TED Talk, and when she made that statement, I said, ah, that's correct. I, every time I come from Chicago or I'm traveling on a train, I just watch, listen to TED, I watch TED Talk. Well, vertical artists, horizontal artists. What is the difference? The horizontal artist is the artist you may see at art fairs, you know, at craft shops, uh, contemporary galleries, you may see them making stuff and set out a little table out so when people buy their work, you know, it's, it's very, they do make good money. They may have reproductions made of the work and, and they make good money. They, they show the work off and some of them go to school, some don't go to school. Okay, the ones who go to school are educated artists, quote unquote. The ones that don't go to school are considered folk artists. Okay, and so as a result, those particular artists are more concerned about enjoying what they're doing and making some money because their artwork helped them pay the bills. Now the vertical artist. The vertical artist is the artist who's more concerned about art history. They're concerned about what has been done before, what is being done now, and what's going to be done in the future. Now, an example of that is Kerry James Marshall. What I like about Kerry James Marshall as an individual who's concerned about research is that he looked at the museums. If you look at museums around the country, they did not have any images of black people that were made by black people or had a positive impact through his imagery. Okay? So he challenged, he confronted the museums by creating a body of work that made you think about museums and academic institutions. Case in point, my students, graduate students, mind you, there was not a single African American in that particular group. I wish it had been because I, I want to see what, it, what would happen if African American is in, the, in this group when I ask them to do something. And what I have them to do is simply this. I take Rembrandt and his paintings, portraits, men and women, children, click, 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 click. And then I ask them, what did you just see? And they go, oh, Rembrandt, oh, you know, the dramatic colors, the shifting of colors, oh, the, the, he really speaks about the poor people, oh, you know, of, of his time. Oh, I like the Dutch, some of the Dutch uh, uh, artifacts that you see in the background. I mean, they're really into it, right? So I said, okay, thank you. So I showed them some more slides of Kerry James Marshall work. Click, click, click. Then I asked him, what did you just see? Nobody say nothing. Everybody looking at each other. What are y'all looking at each other for? What did you see? I'm telling you, literally, no one's saying anything. Now, mind you, I, and I, forgive me not for having some images up here for you to look at, but bear with me. 
one of the images is of a, a bl black woman. I'm talking black, a beautiful, I call her Layla Black. Layla means beautiful night, right? Dark, beautiful. In a kind of a Victorian clothing, beautiful Victorian clothes. They didn't even see the Victorian clothes. Victorian clothing, holding a palette and a brush. Very clean, very bright background, negative space around her. Very beautiful and bright. And she's just looking. That's one. And all of them had that type of aesthetics. But they did not, they didn't want to say, I said, please, would someone tell me what's the first thing that came to your mind? Finally, someone yelled out, black faces. Black faces? Black faces? I knew the answer already. I didn't have need them to tell me that. It was for them to tell themselves. You see, Kerry James Marshall and many others, who I'm not mentioning at the moment, there are many of us who look at what is happening in the world, socially, politically, so forth and so on. And we take that information and we create work and we have to figure out what's gonna be in that work. So you have to do this historical understanding of what, is, what makes it a Victorian uh, a, a garment and why is it important? And why would it, why would it relate to African Americans or anyone a person of color. And do you want to read as someone who's living in America or who was dressed in a, uh, what you call that, a Victorian outfit who actually lives African American, or oh, excuse me, one person of African descent living in Europe? You have to know this. You have to read, 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 study. And then when you're making your statement, who is your audience? Who's the research for? He was not creating research to attack white people, make white people feel uncomfortable. He was simply saying that there's a part of our society, and many parts of our society, has been systematically excluded, not only African Americans, but going and confronting the institution by creating something that they have to confront themselves and look at. Is the work as well for poor quality? No. Is it a relevant uh, content? Yes, it is. Then once he's able to challenge them, next thing you know, people take, paying attention to him. Because he's actually challenging history. He's challenging contemporary times. Long story short, he wound up, I think it was last year before, he had a show at the Smithsonian Museum. Now, Smithsonian is the highest institution that, 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 that collects the artifacts of America and other parts of the world. They have the Smithsonian is a huge landscape of different museums located in Washington, D.C., the capital of our country. Now, one of the things I want to make clear is that how does this idea of research relate to academic environment, okay? I have two students that I like to kind of showcase in my presentation. One is Estevan. Estevan is Mexican, I believe. <laughs> yes, he is. He's, he's of Mexican descent, Mexican-American. The other is Europe-American, Cox, who actually lives to live in Harrisburg. Both of them I was interested in. Estevan, because he was Latin American and because he had a good strong sensibility about graffiti. Excellent. I said, oh man, ooh, we can do something with this. Grant, because he came from a predominantly white community that was very racist. Oh, I said, yeah, I want him. And I recruited him. I recruited him. I said, I want y'all to come, come study with me. We're gonna do some great research together. Both of them wind up into the MacArthur, excuse me, McNair project, they program. I wrote a proposal to get them into the program, they got in. I like to also note that the fact that both of them were featured on the cover of their journal, their work, their research. Now, let me begin by saying that Estevan was looking at light, okay? So he had to study light. 
not only did he have to study light, he had to understand light in the context of art. So what, who is the, so when he looked, he found out the Impressionist. Anybody familiar with Impressionist painting with the little marks of paint, little areas of color? That's the study of light to make things mold. He studied that mark. He studied that light. Then he studied different lights and where it's projected. The light that's projected through this digital image is different than the lights that sometimes where the old televisions that we used to have, and it's different than from the light bulbs that we have. All, all light is not the same. It has different types of temperature, different types of degrees of vibration, all this. And you have to study this. So he's studying this. Then he had to study psychology. What is the psycho, psycho, psychological makeup of how we perceive color? So what did he do? He went to New York, Town Square, stayed, and did the research there. Why? What makes Town Square so unique for an artist? They say Town Square, right? New York is the, is the city that what? Anybody know the saying? That doesn't what? Doesn't sleep. That is right. So you, if you're not asleep, you're going to need some what? Light. So we got artificial light and we got natural light. And he studied how that light affected or looked up on the human figure. And he documented it. Mm-hmm. Re referring to the things that I had him read. And he came back and did a poster presentation for the seminar, research seminar. They said, and I quote the administrators, first time they ever looked at an artist's research and actually understood what was happening. Because I had him break it down, just like a traditional poster, poster presentation. I had, I had him do that. I've been having a lot of students do that. No, 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 they don't agree with me doing it, but I do it anyway. So he came back, he created his body work. Not only did he was able to reference that, but if you anyone know anything about wood cuts or knowing cuts, you had to how you cut into it, you have to know light and shadow in order to make the right cuts and marks. So he thought about that. So even the marks he made on his final paintings had the same movement as one who was working on a wood cut. Look over. How oh, brilliant. He did so well, he went off to Rhode Island School of Design, who gave him a a full ride because of his research. The second gentleman, Grant Cox. I like Grant. Grant loved to put things together. The piece that I really enjoyed when I first met him was he had a thing called Steve. It was a sculpture piece. It was all red. And if you look at it, it was like found objects. And it looked like a skeleton, a skeleton, a skeleton, skeleton, excuse me, skeleton. Form. But he took all these found objects put together, and he was on a big old skateboard. And it was almost life size. I said, man, it, mm, this is creative. And it was a beautiful red. It was, had, it was the kind of red that had a lot of light in it, like it was more linked to an orange red, just a little hint of a yellow. I said, you come study with me. So he did his research. And the title of his research, I, I want to quote it Recycle, repurpose, Revalued. Hmm? Yeah. Now, what's interesting is things that people discard. So I told him, you have to understand what sustainability is. So he just did some reading on sustainability. Don't think about art, just think about sustainability. Then I had him look at recycled objects that, of art made around the world. Africa, South America. You'd be surprised at the things, especially children. Are so sophisticated. I had him study them to, so he can learn how to do something on the academic level. Long story short, he created this assemblage work, and this assemblage work that he created was so impressive that one of our uh, senior professors saw his research in one of the galleries and said, which graduate student produced this work? When he gave a presentation about his research, he had so many references that he could, uh, could, that could apply to it that he had individuals who were working with the federal government, sustainability, want to know more about his philosophy. He left here and went to Delaware. He went to Delaware University because they focus on studio art and not necessarily an emphasis. So he was able to continue experimenting with objects and forms. 
Both of these gentlemen's careers are still going well. They have an exhibition throughout the nation. They're doing major residencies across the country, and I'm very proud of them, and I still can maintain my relationship with them. Research, creative research, is about being able to consider the possibilities. Possibilities not in a, just a romantic sense, but the possibilities of changing a person's life, having an impact on community. Art is the foundation of everything that exists. You cannot bring anything before me that doesn't have its foundation if it's associated with the arts. And so what is creative research? It's the investigation, it's the experimenting, and it's about making sure you see it through for a successful outcome. That's what creative research is about in its essence. And so with that, I know it was a very brief discussion, but I just want to give you a general idea of understanding what is creative research other than someone sitting out there and you see them selling a piece of pottery and say, oh, I'll give you a quarter for it. No. That's why the work in museums and the collectors are so expensive. Because no one knows that it took many years to get to that point, to create that work, to make, that, make it work correctly, make people interested enough. That's why most of the people who are vertical artists either teaching in academia or they work in, have association with some major museum or they got some very strong patrons. Today they call them sponsors, but strong patrons. Okay, you, have the, you can have several patrons who really believe in your ideas and they'll cut you a check every year for 100000 Yeah, that's the art world. That's career research. I'm not, I'm not joking. I've seen the checks written with my own eyes. Made my legs do this? So that's what creative research. So without being long-winded, I hope I was clear. I hope I was forthcoming. And with that, I welcome any questions. And also feel free to visit our website here at the university. We are the School of Art and Design. We have a faculty that is strongly committed to the creative research process and ideas. And I, I can't say much I can't say enough about the people that I work with. I love the people I work with. I love the department I'm in. I love it. I have no problems, good and the bad. Even when things are real bad, I'm happy as I'm happy, very happy, because I have great people I'm working with, and we all strive to make it a strong department. And so with that, feel free to visit us, and I'm opening myself up to any questions you may have. Thank you. Well, I, one of the things that I think I was fortunate to go through was a period of time where they say they weren't giving medicine to kids. <laughs> you know, giving the kids. Because I was, I was hyper. Oh, I was hyper. <laughs> My dad, boy, sit yourself down. I was always, I was always doing it. Then he get mad. Boy, you always tearing something up. But I wasn't tearing up, I was trying to figure it out. I was taking apart, trying to figure it out, trying to, I was always doing something. And, oh, I take stuff and move around. What you, what you doing? Sit your butt down. Now, if back then, if they had given me medication, I would have got the medication. And I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be somewhere else standing like this. Okay, I don't want the medical industry uh, to get upset with me because I still need their support. <laughs> but the thing is, is that what got me doing is that I, was, I had a family and, and people around me who kept saying, you're going to be an artist. Because they started noticing that how they say, oh, look, he actually put something together. Then I, actually st I, I took a radio part and put it back together. Oh, it's actually still working. He's going to be an artist, an engineer, something like that. They kept on telling me. And I, they said it so much, I believed them. I mean, that's the essence of it. I believe that I'm supposed to be an artist. So everything I did was associated with art, mind you. Everything I did when I was in, even I used to hide in, in the library and just look through all the art books, missing my class, getting in trouble. At that time, it was, it was really rough trying to get into art class, especially if you're African American. Most of the art class was for the white students, especially those whose family had money. If you look at that class, you know what they were, everybody, you can tell the clothes they was wearing, you knew they was, had money. But nobody else gets in that class. But the only reason I got in because I was the state champion gym, gymnast in the state of Illinois when I was in high school. And so that's how I was able to get into the art class. Athlete. You're always looking at what is going on now and you always think about what has happened before. And what happens is at some point, you want to have a dialogue, a discussion about it. So if I was a writer, 
I started writing down my thoughts and my notes, and I started looking at sources, and I just started gathering my thoughts. If I'm a dancer, I started working on different moves, testing different moves, t looking at someone else's move and say, oh, guys, I'm going to change that and, and, and be a little more inventive. And, and so and then as a result, it evolves. At some point, at some point, there's a, a spark. It's, it's something that happens like, oh, my God, I, I know what I'm going to do. I see it. It all starts just like start coming together. You know, it's a... Uh, Y'all seen Iron Man, right? And uh, when Iron Man is in his lab and he's, got the, he's moving all the you know, technology, and then he suddenly start, all the stuff starts coming together, and they're like, ah! That's what happened up here. And at that point, it's almost nothing can stop you. But, the, but whatever you're doing can only stop you. And you just kind of pursue it. Most of the individuals who are involved in the arts are very passionate. But not only passion, they're, they're, they're intellectuals. They have to, they always think, they're critical thinkers. And so with the passion and the critical thinking, it's like the heart and the mind comes into a wedlock with each other. And then it just happens. Right now, I'm working on, uh, well, the past few years, I've been working on charcoal as a wet medium. No books about it. Charcoal as a wet medium. And I created several formulas of mixing and creating these liquid fractions, you know, that never existed. Because nobody has, because one thing you have to realize, an artist is an inventor. Especially in academic creative research, it's about being in, got to invent. Uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. When they talk about him, they don't just talk about him as an artist. They talk about what? As an inventor. And he made sculpture pieces. He made he you noticed know, beautiful drawings, a portrait drawings that look like it's kind of like made out of terracotta, beautiful red. That's that wasn't red when he drew it. That that was a nickel, a piece of metal he drew with, and it turned that color. But people talk about how beautiful the color is. I don't think I don't even know if he actually saw the color that color himself. But he created the experiment. He tested it for what? So we benefit from it and we carry it on. So it, it, that's type of inspiration. Once you get that inspiration, you just start just going moving with it and you find the resources to make it happen. And charcoal as a wet medium is what I've been working with for a while. And, and, and I, I've been having exhibitions, doing workshops. But right now, I've been working on the near teeth, near TT and the quarter, which are African string instruments, and the banjo. Now, everybody know who made the banjo, right? Who invented the banjo? Anybody? African-American slaves. African-American slaves invented the banjo. And it was my students who made me decide to do research on it. Because every time I, we talked about it in class, the banjo, especially the Henry Ross Watana, the banjo lesson with the old man holding a little kid on his lap, showing him playing the banjo, kept saying, oh, uh, yes, that's a hillbilly instrument. Hillbilly instrument? Yeah, white hillbillies. I'm like, wait a minute, dude. That first of all, true, many poor whites played the banjo, but the banjo was created by the slaves, responding to the Nia Titi and the Kora string instruments from Africa. And so they're like, oh. So I started changing my lecture, right? Had to change it up, add a little something. I said, you know what? I'm doing research on it. So I started creating these, these forms, wooden forms, out of wood, responding to the aesthetics of both and, and his history associated with it. And I actually had a show at the Mitchell Museum where they debuted five of the pieces there. And so that's how it, you know, you spark with something hits you and you, you start moving toward it and, you, and you, can't, you find yourself, you have to follow through. You have to succeed. I want to say one more thing before I finish up if there's some more questions. Everyone has a creative spirit. If you're a mathematician, you have a creative spirit because you're trying to figure something out. You move, you're trying to move this to this, 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 how this affect this. And he has, you have to develop your own language in order to explain it because if you create something new, there's no light word for it. So what do you do? You create a word for it. You don't make a word up. <laughs> you don't, they don't make words up. That word, whatever that term is, it has some significance in the, reason, in the research itself. You see? So if you're po into politics, which politicians need it more than anybody, they need art more than anybody else right now because they have lost their creative energy. If I were going to a school and ask kids, how many of you are artists? I mean, all the kids raise their hand. And then, when we go get started, they ready. Slow down. Going to maybe college students, 
they get a few people. Oh, I can do a little something. Like that. Going to uh, senior, senior, older people, not senior citizens, but older people. Hardly nobody raised their hand. What happened between childhood and adulthood? That they don't know that they have a creative spirit. They have ability to create new ideas and new ways of thinking and feeling. And so the passion and the intellect must find place. The rational being, lack of passion, is irrational. And the passionate person who has no rational mind is emotion, overly emotional. They must be in wedlock. And I want to leave that with you because I think it's important. So no matter what field you're in, make sure your passion and your intellect is embracing each other and that you realize that you are capable till you die. If there's more questions, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.